Test, test. So we'll be just starting in a minute or two. There's just a couple more people coming in. Arik, if we can get people to uh, find their seat. I love it when a hush comes to the crowd. So thanks for coming out tonight. Ron, you got something to say already? Sorry? I thought you had something to say. Okay. Well, you can talk to Phil about that. I'm only up here for a minute. So thanks for coming out tonight. Um, I will just run through the land acknowledgement. Uh, we acknowledge that the Burke Mountain Naturals conduct our meetings and activities on the unceded core traditional territory of the Coquitlam First Nation, as well as the shared traditional territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, Katsi, Musqueam, and Squamish First Nations. We thank the people who continue to live on these lands and care for them. And now I will um, welcome up Phil as our, our president. Okay, thank you, Ian. Um, yeah, so I just want to welcome everyone today for the, to the meeting. And so we will have a presentation by Ron about the hummingbirds. And then after we'll have a, a question and answer. And then we'll have a break after that for about 20 minutes. And then after that, we'll do the, the wildlife sightings. And I also want to make one, we're gonna make one announcement actually after the break. There's someone here from the Burnaby Preservation, is it Burnaby Preservation Society? Burnaby Mountain. Burnaby Mountain Preservation Society. She just wants to make a brief announcement about her, about her group. And Okay, yeah, so our next meeting is gonna be on May 14th at 7.30, but actually we're still looking for someone to do a presentation. So it's actually, we've been going back and forth in the executive, so we haven't found anybody. Actually, I just heard actually James Bobick said he might have someone who's a, a biologist that does research about songbird migration. So. Maybe we can get her to do a presentation next, next month. Okay, without further ado, I'd like to get Victoria to come up and introduce Ron. <laughs> You're still waiting for it to get dark? <laughs> Okay, yeah, you're the presenter, so we'll, we'll uh, let you be let you be demanding. <laughs> okay, do you want to, Ian? Do you want to maybe take the mic if everyone wants to? Okay, so yeah, just raise your hand if you want to do a wildlife sighting, and uh, Ian will give you the mic. Okay, I've got two rather sad sightings in um, Coquitlam River Park. The first one involves Canada geese. And for the last five years, I think, I've been watching a nesting pair. And every spring, they build a nest on a little island in one of the ponds. And this year, they built the nest. But before I had a chance to actually see the the mother goose nesting because I was away for Easter. When I came back, the nest was empty and the eggs were scattered and the geese were gone. So I figure it's two otters in the area and the gander could probably fend off one because they really aggressively defend that nest, but two would be the big challenge. 
So even though, you know, we've got lots of Canada geese, those are my geese. So <laughs> I was very sad about that. And the other one was, right by the same pond, a dead northern sawwet owl. And um, I called Owl, and they sent a volunteer to pick it up. And she's going to have it sent into the province for testing because I'm quite concerned about um, poison um, for, from the bait boxes for rodents. So in, in the strata that I live in, which is right by Coquitlam River Park, we had gone beyond the bait boxes and we, we were using non-poisonous traps. Um, but this past year, the new council brought in the bait boxes again, and apparently um, we're using first generation anticoagulants, which are still legal, and it's the second generation that they have banned. So I'm wondering if this saw wet all still has been poisoned. So we'll, we'll see, but that'll take a few months. Okay. <laughs> is it is it is it light? <laughs> but hummingbirds right now. Uh, a few weeks ago, I did a talk for a garden club, and um, someone mentioned that uh, they somebody they know who works with one of the rescue centers um, had said that during the, our cold snap, they had had, the rescue center had had a hundred hummingbirds brought to them. And, uh, but then they said most of them recovered. Now I'm gonna get into this a little bit more, but hummingbirds go into a deep torpor every night. It's perfectly normal. So people are scooping these birds that are just asleep and probably doing more damage by taking them to the wildlife center. Um, uh, I'm blown away that they actually found 100 hummingbirds, but still, it's a good indication that we've got a pretty good, a pretty healthy population of them, so that's nice to hear. But it really bothers me when people are interfering with nature trying to do good, but simply not, uh, not knowing uh, what's involved. So, thank you. Can't think of anything else to say. Anybody got any questions? <laughs> I, I can't help but think that they're, the, to the hummingbirds, it might, might be like going to the drunk tank. You know, they're, they're not that I know about that. But. <laughs> Anybody else with uh, some wildlife sightings? No, you haven't thought, oh, sure. Uh, I brought tonight a photo of a um, an owl that we saw last night down at Lafarge Lake, and it was teeming rain, and uh, we thought it was a cat, um, and I just had it confirmed that it was a uh, a barred owl, but an immature, and it wouldn't have been on the ground naturally, but and its parents would have been around somewhere. But it was pretty amazing just to see this on the ground in front of us, maybe you know 30 feet away. It was uh, pretty cool. Anyways, I have the picture to, c to prove it. <laughs> and we had someone to identify it as well, so. Anybody else with some wild, oh, great. Sandy, here you go. Well, I had walked um, along the uh, De Beauvau Slough and I heard a woodpecker and I hadn't heard one in a long time. And then a couple days later, one flies on my my deck ledge, and there, there's a bird feeder right above, and I mean, I never get a, you know, that big of a woodpecker <laughs> coming over to my place, and maybe in the trees, but uh, not sitting on the, on the ledge. So that was, that was wonderful to see. <laughs> Do you know what kind? Yeah, it was a pileated, red-headed oh, woodpecker. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm. It, usually I don't have big birds coming to me around my feeder like that, you know. Maybe the biggest is a, a stellar J or a flicker. Or something. Yeah. 
Anybody else? I'm not really a birder, so I ended up taking a picture, and it was just uh, identified as a varied thrush. And at our place, um, it was after a few days of rain, the sun was shining, and I think it came out of the woods and saw a window through another window and the sunset, and it was on the lawn, and it was like this, and I left it. And the next morning I went out, not sure what I was gonna find, and it was sitting there. And it was, it, I checked a few, we checked it a few times and it didn't move for over an hour. So I think it was knocked out. And the next morning it was just sitting there and I quietly walked up to take a picture and it flew into the woods. <laughs> so. Yeah, we have to have some happy endings. Okay, we got one back here. If anybody remember, remembers Phil Donahue, that's what I feel like. Just because we're still uh, waiting for it to get a bit, bit darker. I was down in New Orleans uh, recently. Um, I didn't take my binoculars, but it was actually fun to just be in the city park and hear mocking, a mockingbird. I'd never heard it before. I was just really intriguing to listen to the, the call. Every time he repeated what he said, said something else and repeated. Um, Black-headed vulture and all along the Mississippi River, these laughing gulls. Um, with a black head, just really fun to watch them, completely different from our girls. But just what you can see, and, and cardinals as well. So just what you can see with looking, and I was really sorry I didn't take my binoculars to see twice as many things. <laughs> Hi. Um, last Thursday, a uh, great blue heron uh, landed on the chimney of the house across the street from me and posed there for about 20 minutes. I got several good pictures of it. That's great. I don't think I've ever seen one on a house before. Thank you. Hi, I'm a visitor uh, from Coma Lake United Church, but uh, I'm really excited to be here. I'm very privileged to live down past Thermal Drive in a neighborhood where we have three chines. So um, you know, one at either end of the block and one through the middle of the block. So um, my place is sort of a little bit of a natural uh, place for birds to be. So um, yes, the varied thrushes are out right now and hopping around my backyard and hummingbirds. But my joy is the, a pileated woodpecker because I have an upside down feeder and uh, every morning they're coming. And I thought at first, I couldn't tell the difference between a man and a, a male and female. So I had to Google it. And uh, thank you, Dr. Google. And it turns out that I have both a male and a female. And they take turns. So I'm really hoping they're nesting somewhere close by so I get to see some babies. But, but so far not. So yeah, no. Sometimes you don't have to go very far, you know. You can just enjoy your own backyard. So how do you calculate the uh, The slash. The, um, the male has a red slash across the cheek, and the female doesn't. But they both have the great red head, and yeah, and you're right, they are mighty big birds. It's rather funny watching them land on the upside down feeder and try and work their way underneath so that they can get some of the suet that is hanging there. So they're very comical, and not intentionally, of course. Anytime I see a peeler woodpecker, it's fabulous. Anybody else? Oh, okay, Dave, we'll go for you since yeah. you yelled. No, I screamed, yes. <laughs> Hello, um, our neighbor has a bird feeder, so this is kind of cheating, I guess would be the best way to describe it. But uh, we do have a lot of ammons, hummingbirds flying around our house. And since we just power raked our front yard and backyard and overseeded, we have more dark eyed juncos than you can shake a stick at trying to eat all our. <clears throat> all our bird seed right now. And because we're just above where you live, we do see the odd bald eagle flying around through the neighborhood as well. So yeah. anyway, that's about all I can tell you. Great, everybody heard that oh. one? Well, I, mine's just a curiosity. I haven't heard any flickers this year. Oh, oh I have. Oh, there, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Calling, 
hammering on, on the vents, yeah. Well, we got one that's hammering on the railing out back. He looks at me through the window and hammers, and I, it's a metal railing, so I kind of went, go for it. Yeah. As long as he doesn't go to the side of the house and drill right. the woods, it's fine. Yeah. And somebody over here had one? Yeah. Right. We're getting well. in there, Ron. <laughs> yeah, this one's about hummingbirds. I've always loved hummingbirds, and actually I live in this building, and I absolutely love it, and I have a little patio, and it faces east, so I get the morning sun. And I have nothing but greater joy when I see these little birds flying around. But I have a bit of a funny story, which will take hopefully not too long. This bird is on the window where the feeder is. And he comes and he's like, you know how they stand and they drink and then they stop and they look and then they flap their wings. Well, I couldn't help it. I started mimicking it, going like this. <laughs> well, this bird started to do the same thing back to me. And I thought, I'm seeing things. Just da -da -da. Then, you know, every time I did that, it did that. Then it flew to the other two feeders that were nearby, landed on one, which I've never seen where it's in, like, in that type of circulation. It's there, it's looking at me, and I said, well, what are you waiting for? You know, as if I'm talking to it. I'm inside, it's outside. And I start flapping. So every time I flap my wings, no, or my wings, my <laughs> arms, <laughs> my arms, it, it, um, it flapped back. And I kid you not. Then it flew, and it was like full of joy. Then it flew to the next feeder, and did the same thing again, waiting there. And I thought, okay, so, <laughs> and it did that. And I must have done that at least six or seven times, just, just like that. And it just did, and all of a sudden it went, and it zoomed off somewhere up there. And I thought, okay. So, um, but I haven't seen any hummingbirds since, and that was about three weeks ago. I don't know whether they have young ones that they're feeding, or they've left, or what. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Oh, great. Catherine. Oh, sorry. Um, about two days ago at Lafarge Lake, I saw a yellow rumped wobbler. It's, yeah. So that's the area, the little area that all the ducks gather around. The two trees, to, the wobbler just lay in there and then flew and then. All, almost like a U-turn back to the tree quite a couple of times. So it's quite amazing. Just before coming this evening, of course, I have the flickers that come all the time. Then there's also another bird. They sound like dolphins at times. They have that, ee, ee, you know? And they're sort of black in color with some speckles of yellow in them. And uh, the hummingbirds come early morning, and then they don't come for the rest of the day. And I make my own nectar, so... Um, I see many and many a different ones. And then bumblebees, I've seen about five or six of the real old bumblebees, the black ones. And we have some that are in our patio area. My husband said today, he's, we've got about three or four of them. And he said there's this massive nectar on them, just like pollen on their legs, eh? So that was just today. So that's pretty amazing, I think, you know? Yeah, so I'm hoping to see more. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Anybody else? Okay, I've got, I've got one. We were talking about the chines, and, and I've been spending quite a bit of time on the trails and the chines, and, and I always hear about bears in the area, but I spend a lot of time in there, and I have never seen a bear when I've been actually hiking in there. I, I know of people that have seen one on the trails, taking photos of them, um, and I've, never, I've not seen any tracks, and I haven't seen any scat. But what I did see in the last couple of days is, is deer tracks on, on two different trails. So uh, that's something new to me in, in the chine. So. That you've had deer. Yeah. Yeah, it's also the other way as well. I know, I know, but but for whatever reason, they're really neat. They don't scat on the trails, and they don't they don't step in the mud for some reason. So, yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? All right, we'll hand it back to to Phil then. Okay, Victoria, you're going to come up and introduce her on. Thank you, Victoria. Can everyone hear me all right? 
Okay, I just want to give this a try and just see how, how well it works. So it's a great pleasure to introduce again our guest, or not our guest speaker, but our speaker this evening, Ron Long. Yes, a longtime member. Ron's presented to us uh, several times in the past, and one of the reasons we keep asking him to come back is because his slideshows contain such exquisite photographs, and that's what we're going to be seeing this evening. Before he retired, Ron was a professional photographer at Simon Fraser University, mostly in the biology department. I hear not in computing science for some reason, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and he told me once that although he loved his career at SFU, he's enjoying life more now, and that in fact he's taken far more photographs since his retirement than he did in all his 36 years of his working career. Now, if you think about it, it's in part due to digital photography, I'm sure. Isn't it, Ron? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, tonight, Ron's going to be showing us a selection of his photos of hummingbirds, mostly taken in South and Central America, but some are taken from right around his home in Coquitlam. So please join me in welcoming Ron Long. Thank you, Victoria. You were supposed to be looking at this beautiful picture of a hummingbird while she was doing that. So where is it? There we go. Um, just be, my, the last trip that I made before COVID shut us all down was to Brazil and it ended up with, with just four days in Ecuador. And um, I've, I got to photograph a lot of hummingbirds in Ecuador just in those few days. And when I started working on the slideshow for that trip, uh, I realized that I was finding information about hummingbirds that I didn't know. And I've been interested in, in birds for quite a long time. And eventually, uh, I, I decided that uh, the, never mind all the other neat birds from that trip, the hummingbirds alone deserved um, a talk just about them. So I'm hoping you'll find it of interest, and uh, I'm pretty sure that there's going to be at least some of this that you probably haven't heard before. <coughs> so we start 43 million years ago. Uh, in Europe and Asia, uh, the hummingbirds split off from their sister group, the swifts. And eventually, about 12 million years ago, the hummingbirds made the, the, the jump from Asia. This is, whoop, sorry. This is uh, Russia across the Bering Sea land bridge into Alaska, and then they worked their way south from there. <clears throat> they moved across to North America, and they left no hummingbirds surviving in Asia and Europe. So today, we only have hummingbirds in the Western Hemisphere, only in North and South America. And once they got to South America, they started evolving new species. And uh, that's still going on. Um, so uh, they, they have done studies that show that new species are evolving more quickly than the extinction rate. So some are falling by the wayside, but new ones are coming along. Um, so now there's... Uh, all of the hummingbirds are, are grouped into nine distinct groups, and you'll see these names uh, uh, turning up um, in, in the pictures. So we've got topazes, hermits, mangoes, brilliants, coquettes, mountain gems, bees, emeralds, and the giant hummingbird is in a, 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 a group all by itself, and we'll, we'll see that. So the numbers go like this. In Canada, we only have five species of humming, hummingbirds. It's basically too cold in Canada for, uh, for more. 
Uh, United States ha has a few more because they do have areas that are, that are warmer. Uh, and little Costa Rica has 50 species. But when we get to South America, it's incredible. Tiny Ecuador has got 152 species. Whoop. And um, Colombia has the world's record for 188 species. Uh, it's really interesting. Uh, Brazil is a huge country, but only 81 species. Um, didn't come across an explanation for that. <clears throat> uh, this won't come as, as any uh, surprise, but hummingbirds are the smallest warm-blooded animal. And they have uh, co-evolved with plants. And in fact, they drive the evolution of their own ecosystems. Uh, and in, in this co-evolution, um, that has led to flowers that have the well-known hummingbird-friendly characteristics that we're, we're all familiar with. The, the uh, tubular red flowers uh, with abundant nectar. And so the evolution of hummingbirds has profoundly affected the evolution of the New World flora. Uh, that's pretty significant when you consider how diverse the, uh, the South America uh, flora is. This came as a surprise. Hummingbirds are the second largest family of birds with over 330 species. There's only one other family that has about 400 species that is larger. <clears throat> Hummingbirds are the only birds that can fly forward and backwards, sideways, and even upside down. And it's the only bird that can hover in midair for a period of time. Kingfishers hover, but they can't do it for as long as a, as a hummingbird can. A hummingbird can fly at 50 kilometers an hour, that's 30 miles an hour, and they dive at 90 kilometers per hour. That's 50 miles an hour. And they do these dives during their, um, their mating displays. And here's one that uh, I was surprised at. Hummingbirds have the biggest brain of all birds relative to the body size. And they also have better eyesight than we do. They use the big brain and I guess need the big brain because they remember every flower that they have visited. And they even remember how long it takes a given flower to refill with nectar after they have visited and drained it. And um, in the jungle, um, let's see, in the jungle, not many flowers uh, re reflect ultraviolet light. So hummingbirds see all the colors that we see, but they also see in ultraviolet light. So yeah, that makes, in a thick jungle, their ability to see ultraviolet makes it easier for them to find flowers that are uh, reflecting uh, ultraviolet. A, um, hummingbirds have excellent hearing, but like most birds, they have no sense of smell. Hummingbirds have the largest hearts relative to body size in the entire animal kingdom. We're not just talking about birds here, we're talking about every animal. The largest heart. A human resting heart rate is 60 to 100 beats per minute. A hummingbird's resting heart rate is 225 times a minute. And in flight, their heart rate is 1,200 times a minute. 
So hummingbirds spend much of their time on, on perches, and that's simply to save energy. <clears throat> um, in flight, normal flight, their wings are beating at about 70 times per second. Now, some hummingbirds in the tropics have unusual tails, and uh, you can see where the name racket tail comes from, the racket-shaped uh, tail feathers. And the booted refers to the, the feathers around the ankles. And these features are all um, used to attract mates. Some species have very long tails, and those tails can also be very colorful. So the colored tails, along with the, the colors that we're familiar with uh, on the, the heads of the birds, this is all used in their mating displays. This guy's called a violet ear because he definitely has violet-colored ear-like feathers that he can erect, and that serves two, two purposes that seem to be contradictory. Um, for some reason, it's um, attractive to female hummingbirds, but it also is used as a threat display to chase other birds and um, uh, uh, other hummingbirds away from his favorite flower patch. It says, stay away from my feeding territory. And uh, these guys are really aggressive. They, they chase away other male hummingbirds as well as large insects like bumblebees and, uh, and hawk moths. The gorgeted hummingbird. Does anybody know what a gorget is? Well, it refers to that color on the neck, but what's the original gorget? I'm going to tell you. <laughs> it's the metal collar and a suit of armor. So applied to the hummingbird, it, um, it works pretty well. Uh, and, and there's quite a few of the hummingbirds have this gorget, have this, uh, the patch of bright feathers on the, on the neck. Um, and once again, those iridescent feathers in the gorget uh, help in attracting a mate, and they also are used, again, for, um, uh, for uh, warning off other hummingbirds. Of course, this one's named for its ruby red gorget. Um, you'll all be familiar with this. The hummingbirds, they burn so much energy that they must feed literally every few minutes. But I was surprised to learn that they will visit a thousand different flowers in a day. So they're busy. Hummingbirds don't like the cold, so some of them have to migrate uh, in winter. So we've got migrations going from Alaska all the way down to, to Mexico, 2,500 miles, and they do this two times a year. But at least that migration route is over land so that they can feed along the way. You know, you'll recognize this guy. This is one of our local um, species. He's the one that has the longest migration in the world. He's the one that migrates from Alaska to Mexico and back. So that migration takes them up to two weeks. So um, they stop and rest and feed along the way. But there's another pretty remarkable migration. The ruby-throated hummingbird migrates across the uh, Gulf of Mexico. That's 800 kilometers 
takes 20 hours of nonstop flying and no feeding along the way. How in the world do they manage that? Well, they apparently, before they start the migration, actually double their body weight laying on fat that is used to uh, uh, um, fuel this long flight. Pretty amazing. Our other one, uh, the Annas, uh, it's fairly recent that they have started overwintering in the Vancouver area. Nobody seems to be quite sure why, but the, the, the thinking is that enough people are now maintaining feeders uh, over the winter that they are able to, to stay here. And they nest just remarkably early. This uh, uh, nest was, or the, the, these eggs were laid in the third week in February during a period of heavy snow and below freezing temperatures. Uh, there's something interesting, or some, uh, some interesting details in, in this picture. Uh, you can see strands of spider web, which give the nest a certain amount of elast elasticity. As the baby birds grow, the nest can expand to accommodate them. And uh, you also see the lichen, which is used as camouflage, and the moss that's used to line the nest. But what I have never heard of before, and uh, th there's nothing about it anywhere, is the bare patch of skin on the back of the baby. It looks to me like a brood patch. So the, I, I'm speculating that the female can spread the, the feathers on her breast so they have direct skin-to-skin -skin contact to transfer heat to the baby. So if any of you ever come across any information that expands on that, I would really like to know about it. <laughs> well, that was quite a, um, an effort because this was uh, outside the patio door of a friend of mine, uh, underneath the an overhang from the house, but there was only about four inches between the nest and the, and the overhang. And uh, uh, the mama bird was away from the nest, so I got out a step stool and I stood up and uh, I still couldn't, couldn't see down into it. So my friend handed me a mirror, one of those old-fashioned hand mirrors with a handle on it. I held it up, and that gave me a perfect view into the, into the nest. Well, at the same time, I had my camera uh, with a macro lens in my other hand, so I just held the mirror up there and took a picture in the mirror. <laughs> That's only the beginning of the challenges in photographing hummingbirds, <laughs> but that's another whole talk. So because of climate change, um, it's having a, a considerable effect uh, on the range of the Anna's hummingbird. So this is the, the, um, the, the normal range, so to speak. Here's Vancouver up here. Um, but because of climate change, conditions at higher elevations, which are the, the, the pale green that you can see along here, are improving. So hummingbirds are able to move to higher elevations. But in the red areas, the climate ha is now too warm for them, and hummingbirds have left those areas. But that's our gain because the blue shows the um, fairly recent expansion of the Anna's range in our area. 
And what's more, they're even now on Haida Gwaii. So they are crossing 60 miles of open water, and even that's pretty remarkable. I didn't know this, but our two species can interbreed. And this leads to um, uh, hybrids that can make identification pretty uh, difficult. <clears throat> we all know that hummingbirds prefer red flowers, and there's no question about that, but in fact, they will feed at any flower um, that, has, uh, that has nectar. <clears throat> Typically, they consume twice their body weight in nectar every day. And I thought this was interesting. In human terms, that would be the equivalent of one of us eating 300 cheeseburgers in a day. <laughs> they have highly specialized tongues, which are often described as uh, straws, and that's completely wrong. The tongue is not, uh, is not a straw. It, it has projections on it that pick up nectar. And um, the tongue are so long that they actually curl up around the inside of the skull. And woodpeckers are, are, are similar. So here's the tongue coming out the beak and it, when it's retracted. When feeding, the tongue flicks in and out at 15 times per second. And um, so that's why the, these, these uh, little barbs along the tongue are, are, are picking up quite a bit of, uh, of nectar with, with each in and out process. They convert sugar to energy with 97% efficiency. There's nothing we do that is 97% efficient. Our energy problems would be solved if we could figure out how to do that. Uh, many flowers are specifically designed to be pollinated by hummingbirds. You can see this one is approaching the flower. Here's the stigma on the flower. So there's pollen on the, on the end of that, um, on, on the stigma. When this, the hummingbird is fully uh, involved, that pollen is now in contact with the top of its head. So um, here you can see the, the white dots of pollen on the face and the, and the base of the, of the bill. And that pollen will be transferred to the next flower that it visits. <clears throat> uh, they feed mainly on nectar, but they also can sip tree sap, juice from fruit. Um, but baby birds require protein so females begin feeding on small insects, which they regurgitate um, for their young. And uh, the hummingbirds hunt insects in several ways. They'll pick them off vegetation. They uh, catch them in midair. They steal them from spiders' webs. And uh, the last one I like, I like best, they will hover next to a swarm of insects and just flick their tongue in and out, pick off the insects in midair. I thought this was interesting. <laughs> the average lifespan of a hummingbird is five to 10 years. Um, 
I've said that they are the second largest family of birds in the world. The largest family are the tyrant flycatchers with about 400 species. And um, I don't think we have any tyrant flycatchers this far north at all. So this is all uh, way south of us. Now, I don't know who counted, but the typical hummingbird has 900 feathers. But hummingbirds have fewer feathers than any other bird. And the reason for fewer feathers is to save weight. Most hummingbirds weigh less than two pennies. Um, they have very small, lightweight feet to promote flight. But that means the, the feet are weak. So they can't walk, they can't even hop. The feet can only be used for perching. <clears throat> and I mentioned this before, to conserve energy at night, they go into a state of semi-hibernation. They lower their body temperature and heart rate. Uh, their metabolism drops by up to 95%. And they do this every night. It's not just because of the cold. But interestingly, females do not enter this torpor state when they're in incubating eggs. They need to keep their body heat up to keep the eggs warm. Um, but because of this deep sleep and weak feet, their grip on a perch may loosen while they're asleep, and they end up hanging upside down, still asleep. And I believe that sometimes they'll even fall to the ground. This is the only bird in the world whose beak is longer than its body. The beak can be up to five inches long, and that means the tongue could be seven and a half inches long. And because the, the, um, the advantage of this long bill is that they can utilize very deep flowers that other uh, hummingbirds can't use. Now, that's it for the hummingbirds, but just before I go, next time I'm here, you're going to see something like this. And if you're lucky, we'll get some really exotic birds from Ecto. <laughs> Thank you, folks. So was that more than you ever wanted to know about hummingbirds? Now you're going to quiz us. <laughs> yeah. Does anybody have any questions for me? Yes. Oh, here we go. Now we got sound. Do the different birds have particular preferences for certain flowers? Uh, do we know? Uh, my impression is they do not. They'll, uh, they're, they're very opportunistic and very uh, um, capable of finding, finding food. Uh, so um, I've not come across anything, any information to indicate that, that they will utilize specific plants only. Um, some, uh, I guess there has been an indication that some birds uh, in the tropics will more or less specialize on things like bromeliads, but that doesn't seem to be a very general thing. Yeah, I know that you mentioned that um, 
the challenges of photographing hummingbirds would be a topic for another presentation, but I'm hoping you could touch a little bit on kind of like the, the tips and tricks of wildlife, wildlife uh, photography. Um. <laughs> he already gave the, us one. The, the, the answer is yes, but uh, Victoria, I could fill your next two meetings just answering that question. <laughs> um, I, have to, I, I, I do have separate talks on photographing hummingbirds and photographing wildlife in general. And mainly, the, the, the absolute primary uh, requirement for a wildlife photographer is patience. Um, on, um, I, I was back to Ecuador just last October, and I spent five hours sitting in the rain on top of a mountain. There was thunder and lightning going on over my head. And uh, after the, the jungle got wet, the frogs started singing. It was the best day of the trip. But that was all in aid of photographing a single species of hummingbird, which was coming to a particular feeder. It's not one that's commonly seen. I never saw it anyplace else. But in five hours, I finally got, I think, three or four decent pictures. So that's what I mean about, um, about patience. Having the right equipment uh, is absolutely essential. And the equipment I'm using now is allowing me to get pictures that would have been totally impossible just one generation of cameras back. Um, I'm using a Nikon D500 and with an 80 to 400 millimeter telephoto lens. Um, that camera can be configured so that the 80 to 400 lens gives me the, the equivalent of 800 millimeters and it's small enough and light enough that I don't have to use a tripod. But it's so responsive that I'm, I'm able to catch birds um, that would have been impossible with the one generation earlier camera. The interesting thing about that is that these days, uh, mirrorless cameras are all the rage and everybody's jumping on the mirrorless bandwagon. Nikon has discontinued the D500 and concentrated entirely on mirrorless cameras. But the good thing about that is that People are trading in their D500s thinking they're getting something better with their mirrorless cameras, and the mirrorless cameras don't come anywhere near, at least the current crop of them, anywhere near the capability of the D500. So you can buy a used D500 now in practically new condition for a fraction of its new price. So if you're looking for a camera, this is the time to do it. Uh, yeah, mirrorless is not the way to go right, right now. Another question? Oh, okay. Quick question. Since you said that the Rufus hummingbirds went all the way to Alaska and everything, is there a specific reason why? Because since they really don't like cold, and <laughs> it's pretty darn cold up there. <laughs> um, I, don't think, I don't think anybody knows the answer to that. Why birds migrate? Um, maybe it would, if they all piled up around here, it might just be get too crowded. I, uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't think there is an answer to that. When th this always comes up, when when I'm uh, when I come back from a trip, I've got all of these pictures. I've got to have something to say about them in the slideshow. So I spend months researching online, reading about each species. And what comes out of that over and over and over again is that how little is known about most things. Uh, everybody in the world is interested in, in, in birds, but 
there's almost no information in, in terms of their, their biology. I ran into the same thing with plants. No information. It's really frustrating. And um, I think that's just an indication that nobody's gotten around to doing the research yet. There's just so much to be done. So, yeah. Now you're just as frustrated as I am. <laughs> well, we got an awful lot of information tonight, so. Um, <laughs> I'm thinking that um, there's an awful lot of species in South America, so I assume a lot of those don't migrate at all. Is that, is that the case? Uh, that's right. Well, in fact, they migrate vertically. Uh, Ecuador is in the Andes, and a lot of Ecuador is very high elevation like upwards of 15,000 feet. And the hummingbirds are living at that elevation. But um, they do, when it, when it gets too cold at their maximum elevation, they do come down to lower, lower elevations where there are still uh, flowers to feed on. Uh, but they don't, they don't migrate laterally uh, very much at all. But that's another talk as well. Ron, you, you mentioned that we have five species of hummingbird in Canada? In Canada, yeah. Yeah, how many of those do we see here? Just two. Just the two. Just the rufus and the annas. Okay, thank you. Yeah, what are the other two? I don't know. Calliope, Calliope yeah. Calliope. One more. And the ruby throated. Uh, yes. So. Okay, so the black chin is the other one. Oh, yeah? That's interesting. They're reported, eh? Interesting. Yeah. That, do you know when they started to be seen, uh, started to overwinter in South Surrey? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's still, that's still pretty recent. So it's, it's kind of neat that we're, we seem to be actually making a difference. <laughs> we have a question for you. Thank you. Um, Tuper, uh, you were saying that they sleep and go into a tuber. Do they ever use that as a defense mechanism? Sorry, use which? Go into that uh, the, hibernating... Oh, the torpor. Torpor, sorry, yeah. yes. As a defense mechanism? No, no. It, it's just uh, a means of uh, shutting down over overnight when they can't feed. And I'm sure you've, you've noticed uh, at your feeders... They are out there in the dark in the evening, tanking up to get through the night. And then, then they're, they're back there really before it's late in the morning. So the overnight period is really a, a hard time for them. So the, the, the torpor is just, um, they're not using energy. The real question is how do the females, when they're um, keeping eggs warm, how do they survive the night? And once again, there's no information on that. Does um, iridescence serve another purpose uh, to, for the hummingbird other than um, mate attraction? That's the primary, the primary reason, but um, 
they they also will use it in in threat displays to to chase other birds um, away. Um, and you you use the right word because those colorful feathers are not colored; they're prisms essentially. And you, you may have have noticed that if you're watching a hummingbird and it turns its head at one angle, you'll see the color, and then it goes black. It just the color disappears, and that's just because the feathers are uh, reflecting, or at least directing the color in a different direction. Uh, it's kind of an interesting process. <coughs> I want to ask about the um, the the dive bombing for their um, di courtship display, mm -hmm. and I've heard that that sound that they make is the tail feathers spreading quickly to put on the brakes or something like that. Could you say more about that? Um, all I've read about that is that yes, it is caused by the feathers, but whether it's actual breaking, uh, I haven't come across that information. Um, but stands to reason because it is at the bottom of the of the the, the swoop that uh, you hear the sound. So, yeah, I would say that's a reasonable assumption. I, I just I recall a few years ago hearing a talk on hummingbirds that about a hundred years ago they were only as far north, I believe, as San Francisco, somewhere in California. Mm -hmm. And so it's over the last century that they've gradually tracked north. I don't know who told me, but it was a, it strikes me it was a Nature Vancouver talk, so it was probably fairly legitimate. Yeah, my only thought on that is that <clears throat> they actually, as I said, they started in Alaska and worked their way south. Uh, so I don't know why they wouldn't have been in between. Um, Conditions must have been reasonable enough for them to uh, to to allow them to to make that move. So they should have been able to stay here. Um, and I and I have not come across any information that would support that at all. Yeah. Yeah, well, well the, but the, cla the glaciers were coming and going, so uh, and maybe that's the clue. Maybe there was a, a, a re recession of the glaciers. The, the birds were able to migrate through here, went south, and then had to wait for the final glacier to, to melt before they started moving back. So, yeah. That all makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Wow. Come to an end for questions. <laughs> They're I'll, all experts now. I will now turn it back to Phil. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to thank Ron so much. It was a really amazing presentation. And thank Good. you so much. Good. Good And I guess we'll take a break for 10 minutes and then we'll come back and finish up the finish up the meeting.
Hello? Okay, that's good. Okay, everyone. Yeah, we're just going to wrap up the meeting. Um, I want to ask um, Margaret Flaherty from the Burnaby Mountain Preservation Society to come up, and she wants to say a few words. Thank you. I, I didn't expect applause. But, um, I have a handout with an application form if you're interested a membership for membership in the Burnaby Mountain Preservation Society. Um, the society existed about 20, 30 to 20 years ago and it was set up to um, get the land on Burnaby Mountain made into a conservation area, um, Burnaby Mountain Conservation Area. And since then, there have been many threats to this uh, conservation area. And we have set up a new society with the same name to uh, address these threats. So if you are at all interested, there is an outline of uh, some of our society's stands or our thoughts, and you could um, and read it and and become a member. It doesn't require much commitment. Um, we'll keep you addressed of what goes on. Have a few meetings a year and. Um, it is better when, and if you agree with our principles, when we go to city council or write letters, if we uh, have many members. So anyway, the, this form is out there. I'll bring more forms in May. And um, yeah, OK, thank you very much.
Okay, um, just a few more announcements before we wrap up. Um, I'm trying to set up a, a meeting of the water term monitors that are doing the water term monitors for Burke Mountain Naturals. So I'll be sending out an email to all people and I hope you can respond. Probably we'll just do the meeting on Zoom. So I hope, I'd like to get all feedback from all the people that have been doing the the water term monitoring. And next I'll, I'll bring Ian up. He wants to talk about some hikes that are gonna be happening. Um, so you might have noticed in the, the latest newsletter there's quite a few hikes in there that we've got coming up between now and uh, end of June, um, as well as one cycle trip that we normally do for the solstice. Um, as, as well as um, they'll be going on the website. We, there's a few on the website, but more will be coming pretty soon. Uh, one that I wanted to talk about, we have a hike on Sunday, and it's into uh, Golden Ears Park. It's, to, uh, it's along Gold Creek. Now, there, I don't know if you've heard, but there's actually been a slide in, in Gold Creek Park, and you can't actually park in the, uh, the Gold Creek parking lot, the one that goes to the Lower Falls. So we'll be doing it a little bit differently. Um, so if you're interested in doing that hike, let me know because we might be starting or might leave uh, the Tri-City areas an hour earlier just to get parking out there. So anyways, um, come out and join on one of the hikes. Okay, thank you everyone for coming out tonight and thank you so much for Ron for your amazing speech. It was really unbelievable and the pictures were really, really amazing. And so the next meeting will be on May 14th at 7.30 p.m. Uh, speaker to be determined. And unfortunately, I will not be here on, at the next meeting because I'm going to Japan to visit my, my family and my friends. I haven't been back to Japan in about five years or so. Okay, thank you everyone for coming out and thank you.